well thank you and uh, thank you again for being here and i feel like um, dr frontera's lecture was sort of a fitting introduction uh, before i begin i will disclose that i'm co-founder of um, movies and mirrored motion works and i do intend to discuss the off-label use of an enzyme for muscle stiffness called hyaluronidase i also have a research grant from med rhythms so as Mona alluded to, I have been studying motor recovery after stroke for uh, quite a few years, and it's been focused on the upper limb. So my initial take on it was that it's injury to the brain that leads to the behavioral and motor dysfunction that we see. And what can we actually you know, where do we intervene? At what level do we intervene? And what's really going on? So we um, tried to use a number of tools uh, that were available, motion capture, EMG, um, and observing patients led us to several different insights. One key insight was that although stroke is a condition of the brain that affects the body, a large proportion of the disability after stroke is due to changes in muscles post-stroke. And you just heard from Dr. Frontera that, almost, that every stroke patient is at risk for sarcopenia. So what is then this relationship? Because we tend to think of rehabilitation as something that you know, promotes neuroplasticity and you know, we're trying to we learned from Dr. Krakauer yesterday that neuroplasticity doesn't necessarily mean that other areas of the brain take over the function of the damaged area of the brain, but that there are existing pathways, right? We also learned from him that the corticospinal tract, that is the chief tract that controls uh, movement, is actually the controller of controllers. You can think of the descending pathways that could as the conductor of an orchestra, if you will, right? The conductor tells you, tells the musicians in the orchestra when to play and what to play. However, if, but it's the actual musicians that create the music. So you can think of the uh, muscles as the musicians in the orchestra. If the muscles don't come online, there is no music, right? So it seems like, um, you know, while clearly brain repair is important, we cannot neglect what's happening to the effectors, the muscles that actually lead to movement to make, if you will, you know, in this analogy, the music. Now, we have over 600 muscles in the human body in this, you know, wonderful orchestra that the nervous system has to conduct, right? And they need to work together for functional movement. Now, what happens, we've clearly seen that as a result of stroke, there are changes in the muscle, right? There is weakness or paresis. And um, that's the negative sign that is clearly obvious uh, from the time stroke happens. But then there are these positive signs, past the city, for example. What is the relationship to the weakness? And what is spasticity and how different is it from muscle stiffness? This has become an area of study for me and I'll explain this a little bit more. But also the abnormal movement or synergy. And then how does that affect energy consumption or the ability to engage in activities and if you don't engage in activity that can potentially lead to reduced cardiovascular capacity which in turn can have an effect on cerebral blood flow and then eventually that might increase the risk of stroke right so what happens to the muscles as a consequence of the stroke can actually affect the brain, can affect neuroplasticity potentially, and also the risk for future stroke, which is something uh, that we really have to target as uh, rehabilitation, as neurologists and rehabilitation professionals. So I'm going to talk about these briefly. Um, 
you know, so what is weakness and how is it produced? Well, clearly weakness is because of disrupted output to the muscles via the motor nerves from the spinal cord, right? And the motor output is produced by activation of motor units, which is defined as a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. So you might recall from your early days of training that uh, there's something called Hahnemann's size principle, where for different force levels, as the force levels increase, you need to recruit larger and larger motor units, right? Now, that's what you see uh, in the graph on the right-hand side, that on the contralateral side of a patient with stroke, as the force level shown on the x-axis increases, your, the patients are able to recruit larger stroke units, uh, which is shown on the uh, y-axis. However, on the affected side, you see that there's a plateau where there seems to be motor unit saturation or you're not able to recruit uh, the motor units as needed. And you can see that in the graph, right? So the evidence, so spasticity and muscle stiffness is actually a very interesting phenomenon because while some people think that it is due to increased overactivity of the muscle, which is a little bit confusing because on the one hand, there is reduced activity uh, due to reduced recruit recruitment of motor units. On the other hand, there could be the subthreshold overactivity that is produced because of a disruption in the descending inputs to the spinal cord neural networks. However, what we know is that spasticity is a sensory motor phenomenon, right? When a muscle is stretched, that sensory information is transmitted via the 1A uh, neuron uh, through the sensory re receptors, which are in the muscle spindles. The muscle spindles, uh, and then that sensory information is what triggers the muscle overactivity. Now, what we know, and this is from research in the 80s, that the muscle spindle activity increases as a proportion of load. So the greater the tension in the muscle or the greater the shortening, the higher the discharge of the muscle spindle, right? So you can see the blue line uh, for each of these graphs represents the state of the relaxed muscle where maybe the spindle is not the spindle is not firing and then the uh, solid black line represents the increased activity of the muscle spindle as tension in the muscle increases right so this is something to bear in mind so it seems like sensory input via the sensory nerves from the muscles may have a huge bearing potentially on spasticity as well as muscle stiffness. I'm going to show you some of our new data down the road on this. Now, we know that patients who are spastic and stiff also tend to have an abnormal pattern of movement. The coordination across the muscles seem to be disrupted. And this has been dis described, you know, very well in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And it is um, outlined here as Brunstrom sequential stages of recovery, where initially, as a result of the stroke, you may have flaccidity or uh, absolutely li very little neural input to the muscles. Uh, the muscles don't have much tone at all. And then you develop spinner synergies, some spasticity, marked spasticity as time goes on. Uh, and then as recovery starts, then maybe more muscles are activated, spasticity decreases, people are able to move out of the synergy pattern. Um, towards more isolated and coordinated movement, right? So there seems to be a clear relationship between the spasticity and motor control. 
And this abnormal movement, this abnormality in mode of control is manifested, manifested as a coupling across the directions of force generation. So this is, um, this is a, a, a method that has been used frequently where uh, patients are asked to make isometric movements in multiple directions. Right, and that the force generated is recorded. And you look at how much the forces are isolated in a particular direction versus coupled across uh, these various directions that they're asked to move in. And what you see in the graph on the right hand side is that compared to controls, patients with stroke have a high degree of coupling of forces across directions, right? And this is what uh, Brunstrom was referring to and Fugelmeyer was referring to as these muscle synergies, this abnormal force coupling, which has huge consequences for how you move because, you know, movement may now take much more effort because you want to move in one direction, but you have the forces pulling in these multiple directions, right? As a result, if you take walking, for instance, you find you can't quite isolate your ankle from your knee, from your hip, from your elbow. And so you have, um, you know, the whole right side tends to move or the affected side tends to move en masse, which can then increase the metabolic cost of transport and reduce walking speed. Right. And we have seen that, um, you know, this is also work from Hopkins uh, by Dr. Romick uh, in his lab, where they showed that as the affected side tries to work, you know, you find that the more paretic they are, the greater the net cost of transport and the worse the walking speed. Right. So clearly what happens if your walking speed is reduced, then that has dire consequences on everything, on ADLs, IADLs, you're more likely to be hospitalized, you have increased fall risk, uh, there's a greater likelihood that you'll be discharged to uh, a subacute facility, you know, and potentially get less rehabilitation interventions. Um, and you might not be able to integrate fully into the community because uh, there is a threshold of walking speed to be a community ambulator. And that is 0.8 meters per second, right? So if you can't walk fast enough uh, to cross that threshold, then that has dire consequences for, uh, for every aspect of function and life, right? Not only that, it's been found that um, your ability to tolerate exercise intensity has a direct bearing on global cerebral blood flow. Right? We know that patients who are able to uh, exercise, as they exercise, their cerebral blood flow increases. Even thinking about exercise actually increases your cerebral blood flow. And then as you exercise, the uh, blood flow increases further. However, if you have low cardiorespiratory fitness, if you have a low walking speed, then that increase in cerebral blood flow doesn't happen in the same way. And you have uh, a plateau or you know, it, is, uh, it is reduced, right? And we also know that the low walking speed, which is shown here in these by these various lines, if your gait speed is less than one meters per second, then what you find is that there's a cumulative hazard, increased uh, cumulatively increased risk of stroke, and that risk actually increases over time, right? So there's a huge imperative to actually understand what these consequences of the stroke are on muscle function, and then to mitigate these consequences to the greatest extent possible. So I would like to say that muscle health is critical for brain health. 
right? Now, brain health may not is also important for muscle health. Clearly, if we don't have the neural input, our muscles are not going to function as well. Uh, but moving is super important to preserve brain health, particularly after stroke. And so this is where prevention and treatment of muscle dysfunction after stroke, I think, becomes imperative. And as Dr. Frontera so eloquently put, you know, um, it is early mobilization. Uh, early rehabilitation can mitigate sarcopenia or at least reduce the amount of sarcopenia. Um, and frequent mobilization, we have found, is quite important because for aerobic, uh, increase in aerobic threshold. So prevention of disuse and increase of functional capacity is our goal. And the earlier we do it, the faster we can potentiate recovery after stroke. So it's been found that clearly there's injury to the CNS, which leads to paresis, you know, which is a hallmark of uh, the dysfunction after stroke, whether it is in your limbs or whether it is in your on your face, swallowing muscles, you know, it is the weakness. Now, I'm clearly going to focus a lot on the upper limb and appendicular muscle uh, weakness and changes there because, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's been my area of study. However, you can extrapolate some of this potentially to other muscles as well. Um, so we heard from Dr. Frontera, it's the changes in the muscles that lead to, that can potentiate the weakness and the dysfunction. I'm going to argue that these changes in muscles are also important for muscle stiffness, both neurally mediated and non-neurally mediated potentially. And, you know, the neural and the non-neural may not be as distinct as we think they are. They may be very much interrelated because of the, um, the muscle spindles being the sense organ in the muscle that transmits information about tension. Um, and stretch, right? And clearly we know that if you don't treat the uh, the neural me, if you if you don't treat the stiffness early on, then you could have loss of muscle. The muscle can get replaced by fibrous tissue, which is non-contractile, and then that may increase passive muscle stiffness. We also know that all of these changes can lead to a lot of the disability, pain, postural adaptations, changes in activities of daily living, increased effort, um, and the list goes on, right? So if we can, uh, the thesis is that if we can try to understand these changes in muscles and mitigate them, uh, we might be better off, right? Uh, one question that comes to mind, and you might ask, we have 600, over 600 muscles in the body, which muscles are most important? And is muscle length important? Are passive interventions such as splinting important? What I would say to you is the literature is quite mixed. However, preserving muscle length, we know, is extremely important in the ICU, right? For example, it is standard of care to make sure that the patients do have a splint to make sure that their um, ankle is mobilized or immobilized, if you will, in the anatomical position so that when they come out of the ICU and are able to begin to walk again, you know, they're not plantar flexed, right? That would make walking very difficult to initiate. Similarly, there are some muscles that tend to become shortened more frequently than others just because of the resting posture that we keep, right? For example, um, the shoulder abductors, the external rotators uh, of the shoulder, elbow extensors, finger extensors, right? And so um, it may be important to preserve muscle length and uh, we will 
talk a little bit more about that, especially in the context of spasticity and muscle stiffness and the postural changes that that might promote. So um, we know that there is a post synergy pattern where the muscles tend to be stuck in certain positions. And so clearly, when we select the muscles for treatment and ask which muscles are most important, it might be important to consider that the first set of muscles that we begin with might be those that help you move out of the synergy pattern, right? And this has been suggested uh, by several sources uh, out there. One of the things that we have tried to do to do just that is to promote bimanual arm training. So early on in my uh, research, what we found, and this has been shown in the literature, that when one side of the brain is injured, the other, the homologous areas of the other side of the brain are recruited to help with the same activity. So typically we have contralateral control. Uh, the right side of your brain is damaged. The left side is paralyzed. Um, but now the left side of the brain can actually help, is recruited to help with movement of the left side of the body, right? And uh, yesterday we heard from Dr. Krakauer that those existing pathways, those pre-existing pathways are what are responsible for the neuro, neural plasticity and the recovery. So our question was, well, how do you harness those pathways on the other side? How can you strengthen them, right? One way that we might be able to do so is to move both sides simultaneously. And in my early research, that is what we found, that when the muscles of one side are activated, there is sub-threshold activation on the other side, right? So the bimanual arm trainer is a device where the two arms are linked. And um, there's also a video game console that might you know, make the training a little bit more engaging and exciting. You could move a completely plegic affected arm by using the unaffected arm, right? So basically it's not a robot that is moving you. It is your body that is moving you through the device. You put both arms in the device, move, let's say the, not, the unaffected right arm and the affected left arm has the same movement that is transmitted. Right, so you can do this with one arm alone, or you can do it with both arms. And the way that we have um, instituted this training is you first do it with the affected arm alone to see how much can the affected arm do by itself, right? If the affected arm can't do very much, then you use the unaffected arm to move the affected arm. So at least you get some passive movement, but what we have found is that it also recruits muscles uh, on both sides of the shoulder blade. These are the anti-gravity muscles. You know, we decided that the first area to train might be those muscles that actually help you go out of your flexor synergy pattern in the upper limb. So you clearly want to promote external rotation at the shoulder. And in order to do that, you need to train or strengthen the external rotators, right? So that they're not overpowered by the uh, spasticity, stiffness, shortening in the internal rotators. And that is what we saw, that um, this was in 22 patients um, who uh, were both controls and in the active and received active training, you saw that when they participated in conventional treatment, you didn't have as much improvement of the strength in these anti-gravity muscles. However, when they used the bimanual arm trainer, you saw that there was increased activation of these anti-gravity muscles. And then this translated into improvement in movement. So increased active movement of shoulder external rotation, 
uh, less so internal rotation because we were fo focusing on the external rotators, uh, flexion, abduction, elbow extension, elbow flexion as well, which then translated into um, more uh, greater change in the fugal Meyer scores. Now, an important point here that goes along with what we've heard is that when the training occurred infrequently or twice a week for six weeks, so this is just 12 sessions of training that we're talking about, the improvement in the fugal Meyer scores was modest. However, if they still got 12 sessions of training, but they got them three times a week and finished the training over four weeks, the change in the fugal Meyer scores was actually much greater. So frequency of training matters because, uh, so uh, just continuing on with where I left off. So, you know, so one way to mitigate the changes um, in muscle strength in particular or recruitment was to use a strategy such as with the bimanual trainer where you're harnessing the motor pathways that are redundant. They're existing and redundant and can be recruited and we're using a training strategy that can potentially recruit those. But we felt that we also need to look more closely at the changes in the muscles per se. Right. So clearly we have learned from the literature that there is atrophy of the muscles, but the muscle is composed of not only the muscle fiber, but also the extracellular matrix. And we also learned from prior literature that the connective tissue that constitutes the extracellular matrix in the muscle is important. So what can we learn about the connective tissue? in the extracellular matrix of the muscle that we didn't know before. Well, what we know is, um, well, let me go back to the previous slide. What we know is that this connective tissue, which constitutes the endomysium, the perimysium, which is around muscle bundles, the endomysium is around uh, individual muscle fibers, the perimysium is around muscle bundles, and the epimysium is around the whole muscle. These are made up of collagen type 1 and type 3, type 3, okay. But in addition to the collagen, you have connective tissue, which is called loose connective tissue. And here, the muscle tissue is stained with hyaluronic acid binding protein. Now, hyaluronic acid is a glycosaminoglycan. It's a sugar molecule that is synthesized from glucose and it is um, an abundant molecule inside the muscle. Uh, if any of you uh, cooks meat, you've seen the slimy structure between you know, the muscles um, you know, as you're cleaning the meat. Well, it turns out that that slimy structure, the slimy uh, stuff is made up of hyaluronic acid. And if you stain it with hyaluronic acid binding protein, it stains brown. And you can actually see that is, it is right around the endomysium, right, the brown stuff. It is in the perimysium. In fact, it's very abundant in the perimysium. And it also surrounds the whole muscle in the epimysium. It turns out that the hyaluronic acid molecule is also abundant in the muscle spindle itself. Okay, so this is a, a slide that shows you the human lumbrical muscle. On the right side, you see toluidine blue staining to see the structures. So you see that the muscle spindle is circled in red, but it's the exact same tissue, uh, same slide that is also stained with hyaluronic acid binding protein, uh, which stains brown on the other side right and you see the muscle spindle is also circled in red and you see there's a lot of brown inside all of that is uh, the periaxial space of the muscle spindle and it turns out that the gradient of hyaluronic acid inside and outside the muscle spindle is important for the ability of the muscle spindle to sense tension 
I showed you earlier on that that's what the muscle spindle does. The firing rate of the uh, 1A fibers increases as the tension in the muscle spindle increases. And so if you have excessive accumulation of hyaluronic acid in, you know, if this gradient is disrupted, then the sensitivity of tension might be abnormal. The other important structure in the perimysium is where the nerve enters the muscle. And what you see is that the area around the nerve, you know, is also extremely abundant in hyaluronic acid. In fact, this is the perineural matrix, and it has been found that if, the, if there is too much hyaluronic acid around the nerves, then it could actually inhibit nerve function, right? So this suggests that the amount of hyaluronic acid in the extracellular matrix of the muscle might actually be quite critical to muscle function. And so um, a few years ago, we had proposed the highly Ronan hypothesis of muscle stiffness, where uh, it was there is evidence out there to show that paresis, mostly immobility, whether from paresis or immobilization, can lead to increased accumulation of hyaluronic acid in the extracellular matrix of muscle. There is also literature to suggest that inflammation muscle overactivity and overuse can also increase the production of hyaluronic acid. And it turns out that hyaluronic acid has one of the most rapid turnover in your body, right? There's 50 grams of hyaluronic acid in our body and it is almost replaced every single day. And this molecule is extremely mechanosensitive, right? So lack of movement, and movement and excessive movement both regulate its production and its degradation. And if there is an imbalance, it can lead to muscle dysfunction. Uh, we actually synthesize a number of our learnings and findings in the context of what is already known about spasticity and neurological injury in this book, uh, Spasticity and Muscle Stiffness, that was just published last year. One of the key uh, things that is really exciting from a therapeutic standpoint is that this hyaluronan accumulation can be reversible by the use of an enzyme called hyaluronidase. However, if it is not treated, if the accumulation is not treated, hyaluronan also acts as a signaling molecule where it can invite fibroblasts that eventually lay down um, collagen type 1 and type 3 and increase the thickening of the endomysium, the perimysium and the epimysium and eventually lead to replacement of healthy muscle tissue by unhealthy, uh, by just uh, fibrosis, eventually leading to contracture, right? So hyaluronan, as I mentioned, is a sugar molecule. It is made up of uh, byproducts of glucose metabolism glucuronic acid and N-acetyl glucosamine. And this disaccharide then binds to itself um, and um, can become a very long polymer that uh, then can have, you know, uh, that can lead to changes. So in the normal situation, hyaluronan is a lubricant in the muscle. There is a very thin layer between muscle fibers it actually facilitates force transmission during movement, right? So uh, it, it facilitates the sliding of muscles against each other. However, when there's too much of it, when it is dysregulated, it aggregates and it increases the viscosity, which eventually leads to the opposite, reduced lubrication and reduced tissue sliding. And the amount of hyaluronic acid accumulation is directly related to the viscosity of the muscle. So greater the accumulation, greater the rise in viscosity. In fact, there's an exponential rise in viscosity with increase in concentrations. And once it becomes viscous, it actually forms uh, solid structures that, uh, you know, 
then actually lead to the muscle fibers potentially sticking to one another. So these are examples of some solid structures that can be formed by the binding of these long chains. So once it forms these solid structures, binding the adjacent muscle fibers together, now the muscle becomes stiff and there could be increased resistance to passive movement. And uh, more force may be needed to be generated to move. And so because there's impaired force transmission, more muscles might need to be recruited to uh, produce the same movement and your movement may become abnormal, right? Now, Interestingly, we can now image this hyaluronic acid accumulation in vivo, in humans, post-stroke, and we published on, you know, the amount of hyaluronic acid in the normal state shown up here um, in the uh, top panel, and then the increasing amounts in the middle panel in patients with stiffness. And you can literally see the consequences of the accumulation on the shape of the muscle and how stuck it is. And then after you treat the muscle with hyaluronidase, you see that there's a reversal to a more normal state where the muscle has uh, restored its shape. So it turns out that human recombinant hyaluronidase has been available and FDA approved in the United States since 2005. Unfortunately, it's not available in other parts of the world uh, as yet, uh, maybe there is something in in China now. But we started using it off-label after approval by the medical director, just as a potential solution for people who may still have spasticity after conventional treatment. And the idea was, could we reduce this extracellular matrix viscosity and potentially break the cascade of changes that eventually take place in the muscle? What we found was very exciting. Uh, we measured stiffness of the muscles um, using the modified Ashwood scale. And at the beginning of treatment, we found that over 50% of the joints showed very high modified Ashwood scale scores of two or three. That means there was a marked increase in muscle tone uh, or a considerable increase in muscle tone where passive movement was difficult. We provided the treatment between T0 and T1, uh, which was um, T1 was within two weeks after treatment. And you see that there's a reversal in the pattern where there is you know, more muscles with uh, no increase in muscle tone. So they were you know, loose, whereas much fewer that were tight. And this pattern persisted even five to six months after the treatment, after just one set of treatments. We published this in Lancet eBiomedicine, and we also were able to show that there are changes, um, not just in stiffness, but in passive range of motion, and surprisingly, also in active range of motion. Now, this was very exciting because some of these patients were so stiff to begin with, we wouldn't expect many changes in active range of motion, especially in the chronic stage. So, um, you know, this is just a little example of uh, somebody that I had treated for several years with Botox. Here she has no active wrist flexion. She has extension. She's trying to flex her wrist, but is unable to. And now one week post injection for the first time, she has some uh, activation. And then what you see is two months post-injection, the movement is much more fluid. So we are currently conducting the first um, randomized control trial of hyaluronidase injections. Uh, the target population is within four months to 10 years of their cerebral injury, stroke, as well as traumatic injuries. They have to have moderate to severe muscle stiffness in the upper limb in uh, two out of four joints. So at the shoulder, between the shoulder, elbow, forearm, and wrist, at least two areas have to have a modified Ashworth sc scale score of two uh, or more. And they should not have received Botox or intrathecal baclofen in the past six months or phenol in the last 12 months. Right. Now, this is a single center, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled sequential trial.
where everybody gets the treatment, either in the first phase or in the second phase. Um, and so although the study is still ongoing, we know that at the end of the study, everybody received both the study drug and the placebo. So I'm able to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into the changes at the beginning, uh, the, the changes from the beginning to the end. And I just want to focus on one little thing, um, and that is, you know, the reflex assessments, uh, the spasticity assessments, which were done in two ways. One with a reflex hammer, so we're looking to uh, measure hyperreflexia. And then we're also looking at responsiveness to stretch with the TARDU test. So basically moving the elbow passively at various speeds and looking at EMG activation. So here is what you see. So this is um, on the TARDU test here is a subject with unilateral hyperreflexia. Um, and this is on tendon tap testing. What you see is that on the unaffected side, there was very little EMG response to the tendon tap. There is a response, uh, which is normal, uh, but it's very small in amplitude. However, on the affected side, there's a much larger response. After treatment, at the end of the study, you see that the affected side shows a very small response, just like the unaffected side which was quite dramatic. We see the same thing for the TARDU. Now, interestingly, um, not everybody had a huge response on the affected side um, on the EMG, right? So there are some patients who don't show your classic hyperreflexia in the same way as other patients do. Instead, they show a more dystonic pattern where the EMG, uh, if you look at the y-axis of the EMG, you know, it is not as much as it was in that previous subject. There is increased EMG activity, but it's sort of like a dystonic constant pattern. Now you see that even those patients tend to show a reduction in their dystonia after treatment. Um, on the TARDU test, you see the same pattern. Again, you see this dystonia. Now, interestingly, what we found was not only did the spasticity decrease, but we were also able to see changes in strength, so recruitment of the muscles in the flexors and the extensors. And so here, you know, we're showing, particularly in the extensors, of the elbow, which is often, you know, elbow flexion is part of the flexor synergy pattern. And we also saw decrease in co-activation across the agonist and antagonist of the elbow after treatment. So to summarize, you know, this has been really exciting because we are beginning to understand that the muscles play a much more important role in uh, recovery after stroke than was previously assumed. We knew that, you know, clearly the muscles are affected because the neural input is affected, but we know that the changes in the muscles themselves are also very important. Uh, muscle health is critical. Immobility and abnormal movements can uh, affect cardiovascular capacity, cerebral blood flow, and increase stroke risk. Um, immobility can increase the accumulation of hyaluronan in the extracellular matrix, which can further impede muscle health along with sarcopenia, paresis, uh, and atrophy. And we have some potential treatments, for example, um, certain training strategies, certain uh, treatments like the hyaluronidase injections. And this is exciting because maybe there is a way to increase muscle strength and coordination while reducing spasticity as well, which may have a bearing on recovery. So I'd like to acknowledge a number of uh, people who have made this work possible, people in my lab, collaborators outside of um, uh, Hopkins, but also the clinical trial team uh, within Hopkins that has made this work possible. Um, so thank you very much, and I will stop sharing and take any questions.